I couldn't forgive him or like him, but I saw what he had done was to him entirely justified. It was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then they retreated back to their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. So I recently got the chance to go to Amsterdam and return to one of, I think, my favourite museums of all time, the Resistance Museum. It's a museum that not only documents the nuances within the rise of Nazi power within the Netherlands and Amsterdam, but also documents all of the ways that people resisted fascism either in very systemic ways that definitely change the course of history or in small symbolic ways and also showcases how almost impossible it is to differentiate between the two. Like Dutch people were doing truly wild things, forging identity cards, printing illegal newsletters, broadcasting songs on the radio mocking the Nazis and even <laughs> this is so Dutch, when in prison and assigned to do their laundry, purposely darning the Nazi socks shut. And that got me thinking about this phrase that's been bouncing and clanging around in my head recently that I used to find illuminating and now I think I kind of find annoying but I couldn't really work out why and it's the phrase there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. I think that it made sense when we first started saying it but I genuinely think in the year of our Lord 2023 I don't know if people know how wild they sound when they say that in an unironic way and I don't mean to be unkind like I know that the world is a very confusing place and for those of us who who aren't experts it's incredibly hard to navigate and when you hear somebody say a cool phrase you want to repeat it but I think it might be time to put this one to rest at least in a casual sense at least in passing I feel like if we use that phrase we have to also include like a little nuanced essay underneath it you know it's giving you won't win so why try it's giving if you can't do everything do nothing it's giving no relationship is perfect <laughs> as a retort if your partner tries to point out some of your behavior that might be genuinely troubling it's the fuck voice phrase of the left i swear and i think it comes from the misunderstanding that when somebody uses the resources that they have to try and make the most ethical or maybe we should just stop using the word ethical and start using the word sensible or logical or long-term self-preserving choice possible that they genuinely earnestly think that they are changing the world. I certainly don't think that when I can make those purchases and I also don't really think that's the point. An example I've used in videos before is that if you're teaching a child not to kick or bite another child you're not doing it because you think it's going to end global systemic violence you're doing it because the self-contained act in itself isn't ideal. You're probably aware that you're not stopping a war by stopping little Jamie biting and drawing blood from little Tom but you are like hey in the immediate term Tom's not having a good time you're not going to make any friends that way and also I would not like to add another violent ravenous potentially cannibal adult into the world we don't need that so please stop biting if i had to break down what confuses me about this statement when i actually take a minute to think about it for a second because i'm not saying that i haven't repeated or said this phrase probably on this channel <laughs> let's face it but the idea that there isn't any ethical consumption under capitalism assumes that ethical refers to something that is the complete ideal situation and not what we traditionally understand as an ethical dilemma, whereas you're trying to find the kindest solution given the circumstances no so there obviously is ethical consumption under capitalism and because consumption in general isn't inherently unethical there's obviously loads of ways to do that ethical consumer which is a magazine literally dedicated to trying to work out all the nuanced ways that that phrase isn't possible has a great article about this phrase actually and the annoying expectation of consumers having to bear the burden of ethical choices and how effective it is hello pigeon what do you have to say about this issue we've just been joined by our, by our pigeon correspondent Excuse me, sir. Um, sorry, just one minute. Who do you bank with? The public need to know if you use a keep cup. 
sir, sir, don't dodge the question. Fast fashion kills, sir, sir, sir. See, sometimes it's the people with the most power that are the most slippery. Anyway, this article breaks down the four types of consumption that are ethical under capitalism. It lists consumer boycotts, solidarity purchasing, buying from cooperatives and veganism. Because if under capitalism, you are buying from people who aren't capitalists or have set up buying systems within capitalism, actively designed to dismantle it, that sounds kind of freaking ethical to me. I don't know, I guess I just see the phrase no ethical consumption under capitalism used as a kind of defensive buffering when somebody sees another person on the internet promoting more ethical ways of consuming or maybe somebody in their real life who is trying to consume more ethically whether that's food or clothing or whatever and they feel like those people's actions are inherently a condemnation of them. Now I'll get on in a second to why I don't think that's true for me or and especially for a lot of people that are trying to buy more ethically i don't think they're really feeling like that i don't think their actions are designed to be a binary contrast to yours and if you see it that way that may say more about how you're feeling about it than maybe how they are but before that i want to point out two things that i think have been misunderstood about ethical consumption one is that people who participate in it think it's ultimately possible just like you still enter into a personal or romantic relationship even though you know the perfect relationship isn't a realistic thing to strive for but also because the reason for participating in it isn't necessarily to bring about systemic change it might just be that you've learned something that makes you feel so so uncomfortable about the way something is produced whether that's animal cruelty or human cruelty that you just want to avoid it at all costs, if possible, given the resources, or sometimes we call that privilege, that you have been given. I think that a lot of people that are vegans are under no illusion that everybody is going to become vegan in the next five years. I don't think that me trying to buy secondhand or from ethical clothing brands is gonna stop people from buying from Primark. It's just that there's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part, sorry. But the second thing is, from what I've read about ethical consumption and what I'm learning, by no means an expert, but I'm trying, is that ethical consumption isn't an end in itself. It's often a gateway drug or a gateway behavior that makes and helps people unlock the numbness they have around the world around them. For instance, I grew up with a dog. My parents have a dog that I really like, and it helped me think more about eating pigs because pigs are more intelligent and very similar in brain pattern to dogs. Someone might make a special effort to go and hunt out that bamboo toothbrush in their supermarket and then think, hey, if I'm going to all of this effort to try and hunt out ethical small implements in my life, why can't my workplace register my pension somewhere that makes more sense? Or when people learn how unregulated and dishonest the fast fashion industry is, even if they still participate in it, a part of their brain is unlocked where they're like, hey, maybe the adults don't have it under control. Maybe loads of them things are unregulated. I wonder about my drinking water. You know, it's part of a thought process that we are going to be forced to go through in the next 20 or 30 years. And if people start with seemingly insignificant items that aren't 1000% ethically produced, then so be it. We don't have time for perfection and it's not even that fun. Obviously I don't have time to delve into all of the shame research that our woman of the moment, Brené Brown has been doing, but I did like this tweet from Hank Green recently be perfect or else is not something we should ask of ourselves but it's even worse to ask it of other people it's a chant that alienates itself a frustration that becomes more and more invisible and thus more and more frustrating it can never bring us forward and i think a good example of this i was thinking about recently is smoking i met somebody who was talking about how she remembers when people were allowed to smoke on the tube on the tube I remember when people were allowed to smoke in pubs in the, in my country and like that feels both very real and quite recent but also wild and alien and I can't believe it used to happen. But if you have been reading about ethical consumption and trying to buy in a more mindful way, it feels incredibly intimidating and obviously you'd be put off and give up about after about 10 minutes of despair if you thought that your task was to convince everybody else around you in your class bracket to buy ethically, that would be a fool's errand. But that's not what anti-smoking campaigners did. They weren't expecting to have to go around to every single citizen in the UK and explain to them why smoking near other people who hadn't consented to it probably wasn't the best. 
they just had to make easy and plug-inable regulations and laws that after a certain grace period, people just started automatically adhering to because that's how culture works. You don't have to change or judge everybody's individual moral fiber to change a system that's inherently harmful. You just need to make some rules. Ultimately, the future is paperwork. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it. It's not flashy banners or songs, I fear that it might be admin. So we've established that shame doesn't work, but it, that statement goes both ways. I feel like with the statement, no ethical consumption under capitalism, that can be weaponized as a criticism of people who are trying to change things. Like, bitch, why bother? I think what we miss about the term ethical consumption under capitalism is that nobody knows how ethical your purchase is apart from you. It has an internal element that you can't just put on a chart or judge with a clipboard. For example, I could walk into Morrison's and pick up the most beautiful, most certified ethical bananas in the history of trade food deals. But if I take them home and I know that I'm not going to be able to eat them and I intentionally, purposely let them rot, I would consider that an unethical purchase. On the other hand, if you're somebody experiencing period poverty and you need to buy the cheapest disposable tampons that your local savers can provide, I would still consider that an ethical purchase. Or at least not an unethical one. Or you could be like me, last summer, sworn advocate for sustainable and ethical secondhand, preferably clothing, but having just been in a horrific car accident where all of your luggage has been confiscated and you're stranded in a town in which you know no one and have to sleep over in it with no luggage, with just your wallet, your phone and your phone charger, yes, I did go in to a fast fashion retailer and purchase some clean knickers so I didn't have to sleep another night in the knickers that I had the car accident in. You know, I just, the label on the product isn't the only thing that determines whether something is an ethical purchase or not, in my opinion. It's circumstantial, it's internal, it's what you know about yourself. And I think what people are insinuating when they say the phrase <laughs> that I keep repeating, no ethical consumption under capitalism, is that they are not willing to be part of the group of people who are trying to change things. And they feel like it is rude of you to imply that they should be. And to that I say, that's fine. The people who are trying to change things, of which I tentatively sometimes include myself in, although I'm incredibly imperfect, those people don't need you to join their cause because research shows that it's only 3.5% of a population that needs to really revolt and peacefully protest for things to change. The rest of the population just need to not get in their way. <laughs> you don't need to be actively pious or pure or doing the right thing all the time as a citizen. You just need to not actively work against the people who are trying to make things better. You could even go on further and just support those people, whether that's just with like a few words of encouragement, asking them for what they need. You can just sit there and not be one of the people that changes everything, but still benefit when those changes are made. That's the story of literally most of our ancestors. But believe me when I say, it feels like to me, like things are going to have to change and quite fast. So emotionally readying yourself for that change is probably the most healthy thing you can do if you can't consume ethically. And I think that a lot of the choices that I'm trying to make in my life aren't because of these lofty ideals of like, I'm trying to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I'm more just like, okay, so in 10 years, I know I'm gonna have to buy this way and I know I'm gonna have to get used to these kinds of products and I know I'm gonna have to get adjusted to this diet. So I might as well, start now. A lot of the time people who are labelled as social justice warriors are simply just people who are trying to mentally live in the future with the hope in the back of their head that they can bring it about a little bit faster. Not to be the heroes of that story but simply tail it in to not get in the way. Sometimes you're not the one with the big red buttons or in the war room underground making the plan. You're just the person who gets to darn the bastard's socks shut. So let us have that. <laughs> at least. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They didn't invent capitalism. The story of the great Gatsby aren't that they are the inherent origin story of evil, but just simply that they were careless people whose carelessness had a domino effect. And what a tragedy to be swept up in the aspirations of trying to be as careless as them. If you know somebody in your life or have been sent this by somebody in your life who is trying to make a change, I would encourage you to think the best of them, to not read their actions in bad faith. And you may find one day that those people will raise your wages, halve your bills and make your ethical consumption 
a future piece of piss. It's gonna be so easy in the future. It's gonna be so good. Thank you so much for watching this small, imperfect, incomplete rant. If you have your own thoughts, which no doubt you do, and they're probably cleverer, cleverer than mine, leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. This video was made possible by the Gumption Club who te keep tipping me for some reason so I can keep making these things. These are some other videos that I've made. You might like them if you like this one. Who can say? I'm not you, you're not me. We only have our own internal compass to go by. Frog's not out.